Bienvenidos a esta nueva sesión del coloquio de matemáticas entre el ICEMAR, la Autónoma de la Complutense y la Universidad Carlos III. Es un placer especial para mí presentar hoy a Elisenda Feliu, entre otras cosas porque fue mi alumna de tesis. Y Elisenda trabaja en biomatemáticas y más concretamente su campo de trabajo es las aplicaciones de la geometría algebraica al estudio de redes de reacciones biomoleculares que es sorprendente así que la geometría algebraica tenga aplicaciones en campos tan, tan distintos de lo que uno se podría imaginar. Entonces, ella empezó su carrera científica en la Universidad de Barcelona, en geometría aritmética, pero mientras hacía la tesis ya compaginó una máster con bioinformática y poco a poco le fue usando el tema este de, de aplicar eh, cosas teóricas a, a, a aplicaciones prácticas en, en reacciones biomoleculares. Y entonces ella se, se asentó en Dinamarca, empezó en la Universidad de Arcus y luego ahora es profesor asociado en la Universidad de Copenhague. Allí ganó una prestigiosa beca, la Sauder... Sapere Aude. Sapere está en Grand, y ahora está ahí afincada y tiene numerosas eh, contribuciones científicas. Pero usted destaca, además de sus contribuciones científicas, eh, su servicio a la comunidad de matemáticas. Es decir, está ahora metido en muchísimas cosas, está de coordinadora de álgebra en la, la agencia Nacional de Investigación, está en la RESME, está, está en un montón de, de otros sitios. Bueno, sin más preámbulos, pues dejaré la palabra a Elisenda, que nos va a hablar, tenéis aquí el título, Soluciones positivas de eh, sistemas polinómicos paramétricos y eh, redes de reacciones bioquímicas. Muchas gracias, José Ignacio, por la presentación. Y bueno, preparé la charla en inglés, porque tampoco sé, sé muy bien el público aquí, entonces voy a hacerla en inglés también. En el fondo es más fácil hablar de matemáticas en inglés a veces cuando vives en el extranjero. Uh, so I wanna emphasize, I wanna make a comment about what Jose uh, Nato said about my background. That I did a master in bioinformatics and I worked for a while with bioinformaticians, but somehow that was too chaotic for me. You know, I come from a very environment of field math, and so. Uh, I wanted to do something related to biology, but I really wanted to do theorems. I wanted to do math. And in the field where I was, it was a lot of try and error. Right? So that's why I, I went to, that, to Denmark and then I found a research field uh, you will get to know now. And I have been working on this for now 12 years. So that's uh, what I talked about. So let me uh, give you. An overview um, of the plan of this talk. And the plan uh, roughly is I will first present you the problem, the mathematical problem. Afterwards, I will tell you where it comes from and why I care about this mathematical problem. And that's where the reaction networks will appear. And then I will talk a bit about some results. Um, along these 12 years on addressing this mathematical problem. Yeah, so I won't go into a lot of technicalities, but maybe uh, some small things uh, will be said uh, here and there. So let's start by uh, explaining what is the mathematical problem uh, that has been uh, entertaining me for the past 12 years. And this mathematical problem consists on considering Uh, systems of polynomial equations of this form. You know, if you see it, uh, well, the colors, but there are some equations uh, that have the coefficients are some parameters, and some parameters are repeated. Here you have a K2, here you have a K2, so they are not completely free. And then there are some linear equations, which essentially these, you can think of each of them as a hyperplane that you translate depending on the C value you choose. And for these systems of equations, the, all the parameters are positive, and I'm interested in positive solutions, because you will see in a while they are concentrations, so that's what we are interested in. For example, um, 
in particular, what we are mostly interested in is in counting and understanding how this set looks like when you vary the parameter values. Right? So I consider parameter values, I consider the solutions of the system, and then I uh, intersect with the positive values. For example, for this uh, system, if I fix these parameter values, I solve the system, this is easy, any software can do it. It has two uh, solutions in uh, C, but only one of them is positive. So my set here that will be appearing in all the, along the top will be the set containing one element in this case. I like to think about these uh, systems, and that's the way they arise, uh, a bit more geometrically, that you think you have two families of algebraic varieties. You think that you have some, uh, like the family of algebraic varieties given by the solutions of the first part, the one that I mark in red. And they have some, here yeah, in the drawing, they have some uh, zero set. And then I intersect these uh, varieties, so the red curves, with a linear subspace that I translate parallel. So these would be the blue lines here, a dashed blue line. This drawing is not, does not correspond to that system. It's just to uh, illustrate what we are doing. And here you can see then the sets C, K, C are where the two families of curves intersect. Like this, the curve giving rise to these parameter values and the linear space giving rise to this um, variety here intersecting one curve. And here you see uh, in this drawing here, whenever I take one red curve and one blue curve, if you look carefully at it, you will find one point in the drawing. So in this context, the set CKC will always have one element. Here, you can see some curves like this one, uh, intersects all the blue lines in one point. So for this one, uh, the set will have one element, but if I go down here, I have a blue curve, I sorry, a red curve that intersects one blue curve in three points. Okay. So for this set, um, the, um, it will have three elements. Yeah. So if, uh, uh, yeah, so the, the question I, we talk about and that I have been working with uh, past years is to understand when that set contains at least two elements. Right? And I will tell you why in a short while. And for that, we are interested in deciding, can it happen? Like we saw in the first drawing, it could not happen. Right? So can it happen? And I won't say much about this because this is kind of solved. There are many methods to decide the yes, no. What is not that easy or not that uh, understood is to understand where does it happen, right? to find the values of k and c where this set has a least to end. And then on top of that, maybe I cannot find the parameter st space, but can I say something about it? Is it connected? Is it not? Right? So I will talk mostly about these last two questions today and implicitly results and exist and will uh, arise because if you find a region, you decide whether it's empty or not. Um, before getting into um, details, I just I want to mention if you gave this problem to any person with a background uh, in algebra, what would they do? What maybe what would be the first thing they would think about? And well, uh, most people in algebra would start thinking what happens in the complex world. And there, things are easier. If you have one value and one equation, you know the degree of the polynomial determines uh, how many complex solutions you have. In general, you have the Zulu theorem that you can have a, a bound, a generic bound for uh, the number of solutions. Here is in projective space, but you just multiply the degrees of your equation. You have a number, the number of the CKC if we were in projective complex space. And you can find refined bounds, even uh, they're called a PKK bound, that looks at solutions that have no zero coordinate. And this is something you can find this bound by just looking at the exponents that appear in your system. You'll find something called a mixed volume, you get a number, and that number is the generic number of solutions you will have if you have a finite number of solutions. 
So in the complex world, this question wouldn't be very interesting somehow. In the real world, things get a bit more messy. Already in one value or one equation, the bound on the number of solutions you have, it's not given by the degree, but it's given by a function of the number of polynomials. This is followed by the Descartes rule of science. Uh, there are also bounds uh, that take into account the support of the system. They are very complicated. I don't want to put any formula here because the simplest formula requires a lot of protection. But these bounds for the problem we have in mind tend to be very large because they are for real solutions or for positive solutions, but they, they don't give the right answer. So we cannot really use these generic results that are out there. And well, okay. Maybe there are no theoretical results, but there are computational methods you maybe can apply. And in fact, the question of understanding this set is, is solved in the sense that there is an algorithm to find the parameter region where there are two solutions to decide whether it's not empty. But these methods are extremely expensive. And for these systems that arise from biology, they don't work it's essentially. Uh, there are too many parameters and too many variables for them to, to say something interesting. So with this very negative uh, introduction that saying all that is out there uh, doesn't work, um, one can say, okay, is there any hope? And the hope is that, yes, that we don't have any polynomial system. I have a polynomial system of this form. And this field of uh, algebraic tools for uh, reaction networks, what essentially what has been doing is to exploit the structure I have to say things that generic methods uh, wouldn't give an answer because they are too generic. They work for all polynomial systems. Right? So that's what you will see uh, now. Uh, so I will now talk more about the research part. And I will tell you where this system comes from, just that you know I'm not lying when I say it's relevant question. Uh, and then I will talk about two uh, results. One, to uh, understand the parameter regions and to understand whether it is connected or not. So reaction networks, I assume you all went to high school. So I assume you all have seen a chemical reaction network uh, at some point in your life, so a reaction network. Uh, mathematically will be uh, for us a bunch of arrows, reactions, you can think of pairs of linear combinations of some uh, elements in a set I call X, right? So this could be hydrogen or carbon and so on. Um, but this X can be really anything, right? Mathematically it doesn't make a difference. For me, for my research, the questions come from uh, molecular biology, they come from cell signaling. So for me, in my head, uh, these axes are proteins, are RNAs, are DNAs. Um, and uh, these are some reactions that you will see a bit later on. And I don't want to enter a lot into the details, but most of cell signaling or gram part of cell, cell signaling occurs because a protein is modified by the uh, phosphate group that becomes attached to it. And then it changes the conformation, and then it can do things it couldn't do in the inactive state. This first state group is representing with a P. And here in the first module here, you see um, the conversion of A to AP. That's an activation of the protein. And K is an enzyme mediating the conversion. And here is another type of uh, mechanism that is common in bacteria, where the P uh, is is jumps into another protein. So two proteins meet, and then the what, first one has the P and then the second one gets it. This reaction levels could be people, the axis could be people, the CERN seal models that you maybe have heard about, <laughs> something happened recently. Uh, they, they can be represented as reaction networks, many of them. And also, uh, prey predator model models, interaction models in ecology, they can often be represented as in the interaction networks, like the rabbit and foxes. Here, that would be a reaction network giving rise to the Lotka Volterra model. You might have seen before. 
Um, as I said, the mathematics doesn't see what we have, but the questions we ask sees what we have, right? Because in the SIR model, like steady state, which is what I will work with, is very uninteresting. Um, and that's interesting, whatever about it. So let me tell you how we go from uh, the action network to the system I had in the beginning of the talk. And we do that by uh, considering uh, ODE system. Here, I mean, you know the reactions and then you choose the modeling assumptions and you choose what the models suit you best. There are many types of models, stochastic, discrete time, continuous time, deterministic. What I work with are deterministic models in continuous time, so ODE based. And these models arise quite systematically uh, in the following way. You uh, consider the concentration of the species you have, and then you assume uh, you have that the, the change, the rate of change of each species is a weighted sum uh, of the speed of the reactions where it takes part of. So, and the weight comes from how many molecules uh, or entities of the species of interest are created or consumed when the reaction takes place. So you, you can see the, the colors here, the first reaction, X1, it's consumed, one, when it takes place, so we put the minus one for the second reaction, X2, I'm sorry, X1, um, two, more, two new molecules are created every time it occurs, and for the third uh, reaction, X1 is consumed one, so that is the minus one. So this part is common in these models. Uh, and then the, the, really, the real model assumption is how do you model the, the speed of the reaction, which is what comes here, right? So what the, and today for the talk, I will assume something called mass action kinetics. This is like basic modeling assumption that it's arguably maybe not so suitable in the cell sometimes because it assumes everything is well stirred and homogeneous and well made. So molecules just bump into each other like by random. But it's still a very used, uh, it's a used uh, modeling assumption. But you could put other things here. And if they are up to bright, what I will talk to you about today will also work. Right? But the mass action kinetics assumes the velocity of these uh, reactions is proportional, <coughs> as okay, I put here, to uh, the amount of reactants you have in a multiplicative way. So if I have come here to x2, so then I put x2 squared, and if I have x1 for x2, I put x1 for uh, x2. So you can really, from the reaction network, build this system automatically in the kind of But of course, checking that the modeling assumption hold, that's not automatic, right? So that's the pathology is maybe to check that. I will assume someone checked that. So my, my research is about if someone gives me the model, how can we analyze it? It's in the anal analysis part, not in the model building part. So a bit of notation, just to write it short. I write this vector as K, the component wise product with X to the P and X to the P is written such that P encodes the exponents of the monomials I have there. So the columns of P are the exponents of my X's. And then for any network, not this one, right? I will always have a matrix in front. That's called that. I call it N. And that's called in the chemical literature, the stoichiometric matrix. It comes the stoichiometry of the reactions. And then I will have N multiplying this. Uh, yeah. And note that the Ks are positive throughout uh, the talk. And the system takes place in the non-negative order. It's an, I mean, Whenever you have the system of this form, automatically the non-negative orton is invariant, it's forward invariant. So if you start with something positive, the concentration won't become negative uh, as time goes. That's good to know. <laughs> and then a uh, small observation, observe that this very simple example, if you add the two rows of n, you get zero. Right? So that means that the derivative of x1 plus x2 is zero. That means that x1 plus x2 is constant along the jacket. So if I know the value of x1 plus x2 at the start of the uh, solution of the system, 
that value will be preserved along the solution. So and we are uh, essentially getting there because now what do we have? Have a reaction network. I've told you how to build an ODE system for that. Then the equilibrium points of this system, steady state, I will call them, uh, is the points where uh, x dot is zero, right? So they are the solutions of zero equal this uh, polynomial system. That's the red part of uh, the beginning of the talk. So the red part are the steady states of the system. And then the blue part arises from that, those linear combinations that were constant, that I said x1 plus x2 is constant. In general, any vector in the left kernel of n will give me one such relation. So I built a matrix uh, whose rows are a basis of the left kernel of a, and then my trajectories are confined into linear subspaces of this form, wx equals some c. And the c is what depends on where you start on the initial condition of the system. Right? When I start, I know the c, and then I know the trajectory is confined there. And that could be a drawing of a system in R3 that you slice with this linear uh, subspaces, but you intersect with the positive order, right? So then you here in that case, you end up with some uh, compact sets. And so it's not just you're moving along all the linear spaces. So the set CKC in the beginning would be then the set of solutions of the two uh, sets of equations. And for the example, that would mean my set is given by this uh, um, expression. And now comes the okay, trick, but the easy observation that any such equation, any such linear equation I have, it arises because there is a linear combination of the other equations given zero. Right? So this one arises because the sum of these two is zero. So I can remove one of them. So I can remove as many as uh, linear relations I have. And in the end, I always end up with a system that is square. I have as many questions and as variables, and the equations are linearly independent. So that's uh, the construction always leads to that. And then we expect, because it's a nice system, uh, the equations are linearly independent, and it's a square that this set will be finite. We expect. We are not sure that that's true. And actually, that's something that uh, in the fifth, we have thought a bit about that. We should think more about how to decide whether it's really happening. But even if it's fine, the number of elements uh, might depend on the parameter values, right? as I showed you in the beginning. And then one says that the, system, the network is multi stationary if there are at least two elements in one of these sets. And the word comes because there are two steady states and two stationary points in one of these sets. Uh, and now I will say very briefly why we care about this question that, uh, <coughs> that's important. And this question comes from the, the wish to decide whether the system has two stable steady states. Right? And in self signaling, uh, one thinks that. If I have a system that with the same parameter values can reside in two different states, that's a way to take decisions. That one state is the inactive state and the other state is the active state. And something maybe happens that makes the system jump from one system to the other, something transient. And why stability is important? And the typical drawing is that. My, Often, by stability in biochemical systems arises through a, something called hysteresis that, if you have not seen before, is, uh, relates to this graph, where you imagine you have a signal coming into the cell. Maybe it's the change of one of the parameters, that uh, one of the parameters gets increased. And then you have one of the excess in the network that you take as the response of the system, that that's the one really going further and uh, doing things, and then you measure the steady state value of that protein of interest. If the system for some parameter values has more than one steady state, so that would be the region when there is more than one steady state and there are three. In this case, there is one that is stable here, one that is unstable there, and up is stable. 
in this region there is only one steady state, in this region there is only one steady state. But now you imagine that the signal is there, the, the system is in the low, the off state, and then you, uh, the signal is increased slow enough to allow the system to adjust to a new steady state. So the signal changes slowly. Then the steady state, its response value will stay here in the off state. But when it gets there, we jump to the next state. So there will be a, an abrupt jump of a level of the response from the off state to the on state. And what is the difference of this and, and just having a very sigmoidal curve? Well, the, once you are in the on state, if small variations of the signal won't make you jump back again, then the system stays in the on state until the signal is really low. So it's a cell decision mechanism that is robust to small variations of the signal. And if you Google by stability or you go to PubMed, the database of biomedical and biological papers, you put the word by stability, you will see this is something that appears quite a lot to decide whether the system is by stable. Deciding a stability is hard. Uh, deciding, finding the solutions of a system is easier, even though it's still complex, right? So that's why we look first whether that is multi stationarity because if there is no multi stationarity, there is no way that could be by stability. Okay. So that was for the motivation part. I hope you got that. This is an interesting question, both mathematically and in the application. And before I uh, explain some of the results, I want to tell you about two ingredients that will occur, appear uh, now that uh, are critical for uh, this work. And one is that uh, it's useful to have a parametrization of the red part. So the, the curves I showed you in red before, sometimes you can find a parametrization. That means you can uh, find a map whose image is exactly the, the solution set of that, the red part, the, the system of equations. For example, uh, for the the example I had in the very first slide today, this was the system, and you can solve it for x1 and x3. It's linear in x1 and x3. You get these very nice expressions, and this is the, when you buy x2 and x4, you get all the points that are solutions of this uh, system. So you can evaluate at the red one. And well, do these parametrizations always exist? And the answer is no. Again, in, in the field of algebra geometry, that would be the weird case that you would find uh, parametrization. But surprisingly often for networks that are realistic, the, you can find it. Like I did now. Ah, it's linear in x1, x3, I saw it. Right? And we have investigated a lot this, uh, this question about when parametrizations exist. That's one of the first things I did actually. In, and very recently, for example, we, we can see that, for example, if we want to ask when the parametrization is, if there is a parametrization that is polynomial, that's in the toric setting, it's very easy linear algebra essentially to decide that for this system, which was a bit surprising. Um, and here, somehow, this word is very unpleasant for a mathematician. Like, can you define me for this thing I work? No, I cannot define. Right. I don't know how to define what the network, how to decide whether a network is realistic. But there are some characteristics that uh, are common. And one is that if you think that we are measuring that proteins interact, proteins are macromolecules. Three proteins interacting at the same time doesn't happen. It usually only happens if you make a very simple model. Right? The proteins interact two, uh, two by two. So it means these systems are often quadratic. And we have often a lot of linearity. That's what allows to use some linear algebra to define parametrizations. And the other uh, characteristic is that the systems are very uh, sparse. So there are very few monomials in them. Right? Each, each molecule is appearing in a few reactions, not in many reactions. So these two things together 
make things work nicely that no definition uh, can be given. And then the other ingredient that uh, this one is very good, it's very useful. I discovered it quite late in 1917, or when I had been already working a lot with this system. That actually, if you want to say something about whether well, something happens for some k, not for I fix the k, I want to understand the x's, but some, some k, then the, the pairs k, x that satisfy the steady state equation can be parameterized by uh, considering the kernel of n, the positive part of the kernel of n uh, times the positive order by just considering this vector, right? This vector is in the positive kernel. Uh, of n, this is a bijection. And what do we gain here is that this is a, a kernel of n intersecting with an negative orthon. It's a polyhedral cone. Polyhedral cones have generators. So you can parameterize this step here. And for the example, um, this went too fast. Too slow. Huh? Sorry. There is some delay in the response. I need to wait. Yes. So, for the example in the previous slide, um, no, sorry, in the running example for the definition of reaction networks, the kernel of N has this form and uh, intersecting with the positive orthogonal. Right? So, we can parameterize this set as just the product of the positive orthogonal. And that we can work with. So uh, now, after this uh, introduction, I will move to the to the next part. I think I will stay here for a while, which is about uh, understanding the parameter regions. And here, what we aim is at uh, understanding where in parameter space, multi-stationarity arises. Yeah. So that's the question. That would be a drawing in a system with two parameters. We want to find this yellow bridge. But let me give you an example that is a bit demotivated about the question. And this is an example. It's a modification of a, a network I showed you before. That um, in this one, Kind of one could work out the equations, reduce everything to one polynomial equations, apply something called the Stum sequences. And I could show that this diamond had three positive state state, even only if these inequalities hold. And these inequalities, there are some A's here. These A's are polynomials in my uh, parameters. Right? If you put this into this one, it doesn't fit a screen. So these are huge expressions. I was very happy because I solved the question. Right? Find the parameter region, I found it. And then I went to back to the, the, the society of biochemist, uh, who's a uh, long-term collaborator of mine, and said, I have a solution. Okay, what do I do with that? What is it telling me about the system? I don't know, I have a solution. <laughs> okay, is it a big region? I don't know. Is it connected? I don't know. Uh, does it mean that uh, that phosphorylation needs to be fast? I don't know. I didn't know anything, so it was very demotivating. Somehow, using the carbon of science, very simple, I could say that you needed K3 to be larger than K1. And then we went with that. That was much easier to sell because here K3 is phosphorylation rate of, you can see, this protein has two places where the phosphate group can be attached. So K3 is the phosphorylation rate when the second one is already occupied, so it already has a first phase, but K1 is the phosphorylation rate of the first site when the second one is ended. That's really a good story, right? You need some kind of cooperativity for the system to have high stability. That was perfect. We got it. That wasn't the supplementary material. <laughs> Hidden. Um, so that's one first problem that even if you have the parameter region, you don't know what to do with that. And here, for the set, uh, here uh, I will show you very briefly one uh, work with it. Uh, it's of numerical nature, where we 
instead of trying to find a parameter region, we kind of made a grid of the parameter region and decided whether there could be multi-stationarity there. And for that, we derived, um, you know, you know Cartwright's formulas about the solutions or the, the, the anti-images of certain values when there is a, a stochastic process happening. And what we did was to think that our case were sampled from an uniform distribution and we could apply that machinery. And that was very nice because then you get a number for the average number of solutions of your system in a box. So that's what it gives you uh, in terms of an integral. And you can compute integrals numerically. Uh, you work a bit in that. So we, we did that and one could find parameter regions like approximated and one could decide is more relevant question that if, if I give you a box, tell me, can I find a point of multi stationarity there or not? Uh, and we could kind of solve it with actual error numerically. But so that's one thing you can do to explore the parameter region. <coughs> and the other thing you can do is to project to think, okay, understanding the whole region in the whole space, maybe it's too complex, but what are the relations in K? What are the relations in C? And there are several works uh, on that. Uh, I've worked on this first part, which is the one I will talk to you about in a short while, but then other people, like behind the center, only they found some very cool results with around the region using C's and uh, some case. And other people, like Brady, Yosef, Kale, they found ways to study on the C's. And here the answers that you will see are simple. So what I will tell you a bit about is about answering this question, which is understanding the projection of the parameter region of the station into the case. And because Sawyer and my collaborator needed a good name for the projection of the parameter region, <laughs> so we decided to call it that the K enables of the station ID, meaning you can lift it to a point in the parameter region. <coughs> so, and here is the main result that we have in that direction. It's rather old now, but it has opened up for a lot of uh, results. And maybe 17 is not old, but the paper was done in 15, just took time to get published. So for me, it's something very old. Um, and the theorem says the following. It says a theorem network that is good enough, fix the K, and assume you can parameterize the system. <laughs> then uh, you can find a polynomial that has the following property, that if the polynomial is positive, it evaluates at a positive value for all positive x, then you will only have one element in that set, whatever c is. If on the other hand, you can find a positive x where the sign of this polynomial is negative, then you are guaranteed that you will be able to find a c where this set has a least two this uh, result is essentially based on showing that the system of interest has degree, Broward degree minus one to the rank of n, and from there, everything follows. The technical conditions are that I cannot have boundary state states, so in the boundary of the positive order, and I need that the trajectory is eventually uh, enter a complex set. And this is extremely insatisfactory for me uh, because. I'm saying something about the system of polynomial equations that has S react S equations of one form, the red ones, and minus S of the others. And to prove it, I really need to use that the trajectories of an ODE system that I had in the beginning with N equations uh, enter a complex set. So I really wish I could prove it directly in the world of, real, of algebra geometry. But uh, to compute this Broward degree, we have to build some homotopies, and these homotopies really use when the trajectories enter the complex set. So it really needs another strategy. Uh, and I say that often in talks, so maybe someone thinks uh, they have an idea, I would be happy to talk about them. This is related to some screaming varieties. I see where it goes, but I, I don't see exactly how to prove it without a dynamical system theory. But still, it's a useful result. Uh, for the network, we had 
in the beginning, I showed you that parameter region that I, it was very complex. Uh, the polynomial looks like that. And uh, you can see all coefficients. So it's a polynomial in two variables, x4, x5. All coefficients are positive, except for this one that the sign depends on the relation between k1 and k2. If this coefficient is also positive or zero, then this polynomial is a polynomial with only positive coefficients. No way it can be negative. So we are in the first scenario, one steady state, right? done. What happens if this coefficient is uh, negative? Well, then you need to think a bit. And you can see that this negative coefficient goes with the only monomial of degree three, dot of degree three. The rest of the monomials are have degree smaller than three. So you just let x4 equal to x5, call it t. You get a polynomial of degree three with negative leading term. You are done. You you are guaranteed you can find the t where the polynomial is negative. So if the coefficient is negative, then the sign of the polynomial can be negative. So I will have two uh, steady states. And that's very beautiful, right? And k enables multi stationarity, even only if k1 is smaller than k3. This is the projection onto the k space of that complicated equation I showed you before. Right? And this method, yeah, and so this method translates the original problem. Yeah. Yes, so this uh, method um, translates the original problem, the understanding the solution of this system into a, a problem of also algebraic nature, that is find the case for which this equation has a solution. Yeah? Did we gain anything, one could say? Still computationally, if you put this question into some algebraic algorithm, Still, it's a hard question. But we gain something that understanding whether a polynomial is what can attain positive or negative values on the positive orphan can be done in some cases using polyhedral techniques, techniques from polyhedral geometry. And these are very fast. So that's uh, what I will show you uh, now. And the first question is. Assume I have a polynomial that has a negative coefficient. That's what I had in the example. And I could argue that the polynomial was negative. Is it always the case? No, right? This is a very easy example. This is a polynomial with a negative coefficient, but it cannot be negative because it is x minus y squared. So you are not guaranteed just by looking at the sign of the coefficients, that would be very easy. But you are not guaranteed that you are not. When are you guaranteed that? And that's where uh, this polyhedral object uh, comes into play, which is the Newton polytop. If you haven't seen it before, this is simply to take all the exponents of your monomials, find the convex hull. That's a polytop, that's a Newton polytop. Here for my example, I draw the six monomials, the six exponents. You can hardly see this is yellow in my slides. This is the the Newton polytope. And then there is the result that says, uh, consider a phase, for example, this one of the Newton polytope, and restrict the polynomial to the phase, meaning just keep the, the part, the monomials that have these has this, has this exponents. So here it would be this edge, right? These two are, would be the restriction to this phase. If that smaller polynomial can be negative, then the whole polynomial can also be negative. And that happens for all phases. That's what it says here a bit more mathematically. And in particular, because if you restrict to a vertex, a vertex is a phase, and the sign is just a sign of the coefficient, this says 
that all the sums of the coefficients of the vertices are attained by the polynomial as well. So, and in my case, this uh, monomial is this uh, point here. This is a vertex of the Newton polytop, and that's why I could do the tree. Right? That's why it worked by just letting the t go into infinity to do the tree. And the proof, uh, like to understand your result, is very easy. It's constructed. You just pick any vector in what's called the outer normal cone uh, of the of the vertex you are considering, and the outer normal cone is simply the the orthogonal vectors to the hyperplanes that will leave the whole polytope on one side and be, and cross the point. Right. So all the directions. So this. Hyperplane doesn't work, but all the hyperplanes that have the autonomous direction this here will work. Like the uh, polytope will be on one side. You just pick any vector and then you um, you evaluate your polynomial to t to the coordinates of the vector. When you do that, because of this property that the whole polytope is on one side of the hyperplane. The monomial you are interested in becomes the leading term. And then you basic uh, uh, polynomial, basic uh, results on univariate polynomials, you are done, right? So for example, if we had this, we wanted to study this vertex, then we would take uh, uh, a vector here. So y would be negative and x would be positive, and this coefficient would become the leading term. So this result means that if when that holds, we can uh, we can verify that the polynomial is negative, and we can find a point where it is negative because it's constructive; it's not only existence. And this works a lot. Like this happens a lot that you can find the, that the polynomial has a negative position that uh, is a vertex, and that means you can find parameter regions in the case. And these parameter regions, when you have a list in Edwards can often be inter interpreted. Like there is some K that is a catalytic constant that is passed. So these ones are useful. And I'm very happy about that in the case that the, the parameter regions are useful. So if you have a positive parameterization, uh, it's when you can find these parameter regions in the case. If you only use those that I, that I call complex parameters, that was parameterizing the pair Kx, you cannot find parameter regions, you lose control of the case, but you can decide multi stationarity. So, still, you can do that part. And here, uh, I will very briefly say that uh, there is this network that is an extension of what I showed in the beginning. This is a protein A that gets phosphorylated in two sides the first one and then the second one. And K is the enzyme helping that happen. It's called that. Kinase. And then there is uh, the process of uh, getting rid of the phosphate groups, which is called dephosphorylation, and it, 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 it happens in the same way. So here the, the polynomial is a bit larger. Um, it's this one, you might not see very well. I try to color the coefficients that can be negative, and there are essentially two polynomials in the parameters that appear, this one and this one. So there are two expressions to consider. And then, well, if they are both positive, done, right? There cannot be much stationarity. It happens that this one corresponds to a vertex of the Newton polytope, done. It's again an easy case. There can be much stationarity. And this is something that this uh, Congradian and Sheva worked out in 2015. Um, without using the Newton polytope, they found by hand how to prove that the polynomial could be negative. But they left open the case what happens if this is positive and this is negative. And here we get an annoying page that the point is here. You can see this is a three dimensional polytope, it has a hexagonal face here. And that point of interest is in the middle of the face. So I cannot apply the result. And why is that? Well, again, the basic example, that polynomial that could not be negative, if I increase it with the, the, the coefficient, then it can be negative. 
So for when the coefficient, where the monomials are not vertices, then the coefficient matters. There, are, there is some condition on the coefficient in relation to the rest that will uh, make the polynomial negative if it holds, and if it doesn't hold, the polynomial will be non negative. Finding these conditions is a completely open research area that there are many few results to these two, like even a, even a polynomial with a negative exponent, uh, negative coefficients, what is the relation on the coefficients that's uh, a lot, that may be negative. But there are some uh, results, very few, but there are some. And one of them is uh, through what's called circuit numbers, and it considers polynomials that the support is the Newton polytop is a simplex and there is an extra point in the middle. And this extra point in the middle is the one that is allowed to be negative. Right? So we have a polynomial that the exponents, all of them form a simplex, and then there is an extra polynomial. And for those, it is very easy to find the condition for the polynomial to be there. And that number is called the circle number. It's not very important now, but what uh, we did here was to realize that our point here of interest was actually the very center of four simplices that covered all the other monomials. Okay. So we first restricted the polynomial to the face. We can do that by what I told you before, that knowing the signs of the face is means I know the signs of the rest. And then we decompose the polynomial as a sum of four simplices. And from there, we could find a condition that said when V1 is positive, because that's the one that we understand, and V2 is negative. If V2 is not large enough, the polynomial will be non-negative, so there won't be multistationality. We could also show that under the same hypothesis, if K1 and K4 was large enough, then the polynomial could be negative. And then we could actually found, find more parameterizing the region, uh, the, the boundary of the two regions. And something I was a bit happy about, that we could show that this region in the K, so the projection of the parameter region into K, where, where the system was multi stationary, was connected. And I was happy about that because that was a question. You know, you all, we all have questions that are in the background that we want to solve and it doesn't happen. And for me, one of the questions I want, have wanted to address for a long time was understanding connectivity of the parameter region. And I talked to people and <coughs> not much came out of that about how can we do that? I mean, not using these algorithms that are out there because I know they train. And I have been giving this question to most people going through my group, how could we do that? And some people tried and nothing came out, but we did uh, understood a bit more. But then at some point, and that will be the very last part, something happened. And that's the last part of this talk to understand the connectivity. And let me tell you that, as I said, this is, this is a very unexplored question also. And the only result I know about is very recent is um, a paper, I know maybe some of you know Dan Bates, he's uh, algebraic geometry, working with numerical algebraic geometry. Uh, and Jeremy Gunabardina is former topologist, he did a PhD with Adams, the one of Adams operations, if you heard about that. And he, he's now in the bio lab, so he's doing experiments. So it's quite cool uh, um, what he's doing. But they explore the question of uh, connectivity for the, this dual force correlation system I had in the previous slide, the one with the hexagon first. Okay? And they said that uh, it looks like it's connected, but it was a numerical study, they couldn't confirm it. Okay? So I gave, the, I gave the question, as I've done to many people, to uh, Marty Tillich. He, he came to visit me as an Erasmus trainee, and then I hired him as a research assistant. And then I told him, how could we decide connectivity for parameter region? I gave him two questions, one that I thought was easy, and this one that I thought was very difficult. 
and he solved the difficult one. And then he says it's still open, but because we thought that difficult one was more, more interesting. But, but um, and then he said, I don't know if it helps that I can see that that polynomial you have in that other theorem. Uh, if we can show that the anti image of the negative real line is positive, is connected, that means that uh, the, the, the values where it um, is negative is connected. Let's say G is a polynomial constructed by considering S and K as uh, variables. Then, and also technical condition, uh, then the parameter region will be connected. So uh, and again, this is uh, the pictures. We don't see the colors, but we see the signs. Uh, we have a polynomial here, for example. This here is the zero set. In all this region, the polynomial is negative. In all this region, the polynomial is positive. So I'm interested in knowing whether the region where it is negative is connected. Right? So that's the statement there. If that happens, if I can decide that question, then uh, then I will know that the parameter region is connected. Again, we translated the problem uh, that had a, an algebraic flavor to another problem that also has an algebraic flavor, right? And again, he asked me, I don't know if it helps, but I observed that. And then we had the good experience of the Newton polyton before, right? So let's look at the Newton polyton, let's look uh, whether we can do something. And uh, we could. Uh, do uh, quite a few things, and we have many results about concerning the how this the points that correspond to positive monomials uh, are located in relation to the points that correspond with negative monomials. Uh, we have several results about the connectivity then of the parameter region of interest, but um, the one that is useful is this one. Which says that if I can find a separating hyperplane, and it's a hyperplane that leaves negative points on one side and positive points on the other, and on the hyperplane, it doesn't matter, everything can be there. If I can find that, then uh, for any polynomial uh, G, well, here now it's a but this is not related to reaction levels, this is just take any polynomial. If that happens, then the region where the polynomial is negative is connected, and it's more than that is contractible, and that technical condition also holds. And for example, that happens for the example before, this is a separating hyperplane, right? So it leaves uh, positive, uh, it separates positive and negative. The proof, uh, again, is that it is constructive and the easy, the easy one is to show it when the hyperplane does not contain points, uh, any uh, exponent. For that one, we need to work a bit more. But if, if we are in the situation that there are no points on the hyperplane, it means you have many hyperplanes. You can move them. So you have a basis of hyperplanes. And when you have that, you also observe that if you start in the region and you take any of these vectors defining the hyperplane, you will stay in the region if you move along this path. And then the trick is that to consider two points that are in the negative region. And then because of this freedom, you consider these paths and you choose this prop uh, appropriately. And at some point, they will meet. That's the idea. Ah, that's not a G. Sorry. There shouldn't be a G here. But at some point, they meet. So the region is connected, and this path is the one that gives the contraction. But uh, to finalize, let's put, uh, let's put it all together. Uh, there was this theorem saying to decide on the parameter region, I need to check this condition. And then we have uh, a way to check the condition. So we put it all together, and the existence of these hyperplanes guarantee that the parameter region is connected. And for this system, the one with the very complicated parameter region I showed you, it's connected. So the paper is already published in 15, so no way, I cannot go back, but uh, I can tell now, so yeah, it was connected <laughs> seven years later. Um, and that's what I said. For that dual phosphorylation cycle, where there was a numerical study, we could also show that it's connected. And the uh, cool part of it is that 
continue the job and said it's fast. I mean, for these two sites, we can decide it in 1,26 seconds, but this is false. That admits an extension that you keep adding sites, the population sites for the three sites. We still can do it for the four sites and we get into trouble to compute the polynomial, right? It's not a polyhedral part of the space, to compute the polynomial. And then here are two other networks. You can see this is the number of variables of the polynomial. This is the number of monomials that have positive coefficients. And these are the number of monomials with negative coefficients. We are really talking about huge polynomials with 20,000 monomials. And in less than five minutes, we can conclude that the parameter region is connected. And so we are quite happy about that. this uh, results and we still are preparing this. So I will conclude. Thank you you all for your attention and the organizers for inviting me to be here. And these are the faces of the names I have been uh, mentioning uh, along the top uh, that are part of the words I have. Thank you very much for this nice lecture. Are there questions in the audience? Yeah, so thanks for the talk. It was really great. I'm not an expert by any means in this area, so that was very good for me. And so my question is, in the last theorem, you say that if you find this hyperplane, you can decide if the region is connected or not. But does it mean that if you don't find it, the region is not OK, so it's no, not. No, no. Uh, well, that would be nice. And <clears throat> yeah. yeah. But that's the hard part that we have many networks where we cannot find the hyperplane. But as this is the only criterion we have to decide connectivity, we don't know how to check that it's not connected. But yeah. uh, that's, uh, yeah. we are working on that. Wait, I think for some small examples, you can do it, of course, right? Because yeah, yeah, you can yeah. plot it essentially. And yeah. yeah, and I don't understand about this, but is there any way you can um, use? Like nonlinear separatrices to find that, or I don't know if that's possible. Find the uh, activity. Yeah. yeah. No, I uh, don't know. Uh, they should be of a very specific form to work out, but maybe one could find other, yeah, other type of separated forms. That form of separating objects maybe could be different. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Um, you mentioned several times this multi-stationarity. Uh, what does it mean for the reaction network uh, that molecules can coexist? What is the picture? Why are they so important for the understanding the reaction. So. Yeah, the picture is that you have under the very same conditions, you can be either in one state, let's say x1 very low, x2 very large, or in another state, which is x2 very small and x1 very large. Right? So that's a static picture that you, at steady state, you are either there or there. But then if you combine that with uh, the cell is not static, that parameters change, mm -hmm. that change in parameters would allow you to, to go from, because you have this picture static for one set of parameters, but it's reproduced in, like, for other sets of parameters, right? You have two steady states that vary when you vary the parameters until you lose them. And then the idea is that you might change a bit some parameter values, and then that would allow you to change to the other state. So that's, uh, so that, that the theory is that the cell plays with these parameters to to be either in this inactive state. I say the cell, but I mean a mechanism inside the cell, right? It's more specific to change to one uh, a state to the other. But of course, they need to be stable. So this part doesn't cease to be I worked on that as well. I was thinking more on quantum mechanics, where you can jump from one stationary state to another one. Yeah, that's the other yeah. thing that when you combine them uh, with the stochastic models, then you allow the model to 
do the jump by themselves, right? And you are in one state, and then at some point there will be a jump, and then you are in the other. Deterministically, you don't jump because you are either one bottom place or the other, so we vary the parameters uh, continuously. That's what we do. Yes. Just for curiosity, you mentioned the CF model. So, is there any epidemiological interpretation of the result? No, that's the thing. I mean, this, this is all about steady states and you know, epidemiology model. Steady states, not everyone is that. No, it's done, right? There is no effective people. So, that's why I said, that even though the formalism is the same, you can interpret the system as an attraction system. This theory is not useful. Also, the steady state that boundary steady state is epidemiology model usually, or in many of them. And here we ignore the boundary. Some more questions? So, related uh, to what you have said before, or we have seen in this slide about the stasis. So not only the, the fact that you have positive solutions is important, but only the stability yeah, is yeah. an important thing. Yeah. Is there any way to put the stability in this algebraic framework? Yeah, so yeah, that's, I haven't talked about it, but uh, you can use the, the Hurwitz conditions. Uh, these are, uh, these are, so you, you have your characteristic polynomial. So the stability, one way to decide that is through eigenvalues of the Jacobian matrix evaluated state state, you compute the characteristic polynomial, you build a matrix called the Hurwitz matrix, and of these matrix, you find all the principal minors. And then there are some sign conditions. So if all these minors are positive uh, for all parameter values, you will have uh, stability. Hmm. If, so we can translate studying stability to studying uh, the solutions of a semi-algebraic set even by sign conditions. And this can be done, but uh, because you need to evaluate the parameterization at the steady state, yeah. you need to know the steady states. Exactly, because for them, you only know that there are, there are steady states. Yeah, but when you have parameterizations, you can do things. That's the thing. Like that. That's the, and the same for hop application, <coughs> which is also about some conditional eigenvalue. All this, uh, you can do it algebraically. Uh, in some cases, not in, but it's like it's more complex because the Hurwitz determinants are explode. Yeah. And you cannot compute them often. Mm. Very big. So then there's a philosophical reason why toric varieties appear so often in this in this case. Uh, <coughs> there is a there is a type of systems that go back to all this theory was started by uh, some chemical engineers in the 70s. One of them is called Feinberg, Horn and Jackson. And they discovered that uh, if the network has what's called deficiency zero, which is the deficiency is a number you can compute from the graph. If that happens, then the steady states are correct. Mm -hmm. So that it means the variety of steady states is parameterizable by monomials. And I think that was the first result, and they didn't use the word toric, but they found the monomials, and then later on, Sulfur, Dickenstein, they put it into a more algebraic framework that boosted the data, <laughs> made it more famous. And but the, I think the main reason reason we care about it is that the simplest parameterization you can have is a monomial parameterization, right? So we are very happy when you find them. One thing is that you want that. Another thing is that you want. we want that, so we want to be able to decide when that happens. And a last question: This question about connectivity is this a mathematical uh, obsession that we have as to the connectivity, or really has uh, interesting? Uh, uh, I mean, has a reflect in in so chemistry or in? I biology? will uh, praise the whenever Dina. See, he is very good at writing papers. Yes. <laughs> and he's close contact with the uh, biologist. And uh, somehow, I mean, the, the reason I wanted to know it is was a bit a mathematical question. Right? I mean, it's the first question you ask if you want to picture uh, the region, right? But uh, the idea behind it is that 
different regions should correspond to different mechanisms. Mm -hmm. So if you can move continuously from one point to the other, you could say it's the same mechanism underlying. But that's a bit hand waving also, right? Because the region gets really mm -hmm. yeah. very large and then you would be two regions that are but if the two regions are disconnected, then you can talk about different mechanisms. So that's the philosophical question, but it's an interesting mathematical. Yeah. Are there more questions or comments? Okay, if not, let's thank Elisenda again. <laughs>